So, um, recently I've been traveling a lot after the Waysack celebration here, which again was quite full on. Uh, then I traveled up to, over to um, to Melbourne to help their Waysack celebrations and also to look at the Newbury Monastery uh, which is being constructed just outside of Melbourne and then afterwards an overnight flight to, to Thailand to teach a nine day retreat and then also a seven day retreat and that was followed by a trip down to Singapore to teach a couple of talks over there and, and other stuff so I've only just returned this afternoon. And what was really weird <coughs> was when I was over there, my cough was really much more um, interfering. But coming back here, it seems to be find far more health and peace. Why? So I decided to give a talk this evening on bringing joy into sickness. Because sometimes people when they're sick, we can get very depressed. We feel, oh, when will this sickness be over? I don't want to be sick. We add negativity to what any physical problems which we have. And you do find it makes it much worse. And Sometimes uh, I do push the envelope with some of the things I say, but I do this you know, with experience and wisdom. And sometimes when people sort of develop things like cancers, I tell them, just not everybody, but just a select few, enjoy your cancer. And they think, what the heck are you saying? How can you say that? Enjoy your cancer. Mm -hmm. Cancer is a terrible thing. It's a challenge to life. And it means you have to go through so much of these therapies which you know, are unpleasant. And it stops everything else because, you know, if you don't get it right, you will die. So sometimes it takes a little bit of nerve for me to advise people who trust me Enjoy your cancer. What does it really mean? It comes back to a time that when the first time I started messing around with this was as a student at university. One thing with being a student, I had a mind which would explore, which would, you know, not just say things, oh, that can't be that can't happen just because it didn't fit into my world view. But to actually give it a try, see what happens. Maybe it works, maybe it doesn't work. But at least I'd go through my own experience, test it out. <coughs> so on this occasion, being a little bit stupid, that I was invited to the, the college boat club only because they were giving free sherry. You know, really good stuff too. There's Cambridge, you know, they just they didn't mess around with you no know, cheap liquor. I'm saying that because I said I was stupid. I, this is not advisable. This is what happens when you get involved with such things. And the next thing I knew, I must have been some drinking too much, but I signed up for the boat club. I never went there because I was never into competition or exercise or whatever. That's just against me. No, against my, you know, who I was. Because I never liked competing against anybody. You know, to this day, just competition, I think, it can be helpful, but many times competition is against your friends. And, you know, it's my friend. What do I want to compete for? You know, you win. And it's, uh, it's one of the reasons why that I disliked um, setting exams, whether I was a school teacher, or even doing examinations. Because there's one thing, when I was doing an examination, I was competing against my, my friends, my best friends. And sometimes I really wanted, because I saw, you know, my best friend, you know, was doing a test, and was having trouble. I thought, the obligation to help a friend, you know, can I help you? And the teacher said, that's cheating. 
It's not cheating, it's just compassion. God didn't see it the same way as other people did. You know, you're trying to helping somebody if they don't understand it. You know, I'm doing the same exam. It, it doesn't matter who comes top. Aren't oh, exams there just to, to help people learn? And so I never liked competition at all. And to this day, I always think that's one of the reasons we're such a competitive, at least now in my day, such a competitive society such a competitive um, education system. You have tables and NAPLAN tests and, and goodness knows what else. Who comes the best, who comes up? Real life isn't like that. Real life means we have to, to uh, cooperate. We have to help one another. If someone's really sick or if somebody's really weak in something, we help them out. It's not a competition who's best. We work together to learn and to improve. So, because of that, even doing sport, I really didn't like sort of doing sport because always competing against somebody. And even these days, they say, well, competing against yourself. I was a Buddhist even then. There is no self, so who am I competing against? Who's competing against who? But anyway, there I was. I joined up. So I did have the sense of um, a commitment and whatever promise I'd made, I would try and keep. So there I was one day in the boat, one of these eights, with an oar in my hand, rowing the oar, rowing the oar, and just, it was a long race. And the long race, even halfway, it was just, re it's really painful. Because you're trying your very best. And I remember almost like seeing like red. I don't know why it was the color red. Like, it wasn't really a limiter, but everything looked red because I was pulling really hard and you know, trying to keep up trying to race somebody else. And that was when the coach, the coach was on a bicycle, you know, with a megaphone. That's how they used to do things in those days. And he shouted out at me, said my name. He said, uh, Peter, that's my name as a, when I was a layperson. Peter, you're making an ugly face. And, you know, because it was really a struggle. And he said, you know, just, lighten up your face. And that was the coach's advice, which I heard. And I say, because you, know, you were willing to try anything at that time, you know, your views was just so malleable, nothing was fixed and solid and concrete. I tried it. it just instead of, uh, and I smiled. And you know, my goodness, it worked. A simple change of facial expressions, the awe was easier to pull. And I could do it faster. And it, those sorts of things shock you. You think, why is a simple thing like that? How does it work? And to me it was quite obvious, you know, when you consider it, that when you add negativity to whatever you're doing, everything becomes much more difficult. The awes become heavier. And just, there's no fun in it. But you put a little bit of joy into it, and the idea of just making a happy face is as soon as you do that, it just um, transfers into your mind. Your mind becomes more joyful. Now the body and the mind has a connection there. Obviously you can disconnect that in the deep meditations, but usually it's connected. And your emotions are played out in your physical expressions, especially on the face. I don't know how many times I've seen these articles about psychology, where they say you can get different facial expressions, and throughout all cultures, it seems, you can recognize, oh, that's anger, or that's fear, or that's, I don't know, I don't know what else, grief. The physical expressions of that on human beings' face seem to be universal. But whatever, there is a connection there between the emotions on your face and the state of uh, the uh, physical appearance on the face and the emotions which are connected to them. And because of that, you can actually sort of uh, manipulate your emotions by changing expressions on your face. So, and everybody knows that just an emotion of happiness and joy is incredibly healthy and positive for you. An emotion of negativity, fear, anger, that really just affects 
you know, the, the physical health. That connection we know and we use. So, to make joy with your sickness is actually just a way of healing the sickness. It's a way of giving a positive part to whatever you're feeling so it does ameliorate, it gets less and you have a much happier time. That was reinforced later on when I was in Thailand and I wrote about this story where in that first book which I wrote. But an interesting aside to that first book which I wrote called Opening the Door of Your Heart because this happened when I was in Melbourne uh, on this recent trip. And writing a book, that opening the door of your heart, the whole reason for that, writing the book, was because of this uh, woman who used to come to our Armadale group who had been going through a terrible divorce. These things happen in today's world, unfortunately. And she was just, it was so traumatic for her Hopefully you never have to go through that, but some of you already have. And <coughs> it was so terrible for her, she came to these little talks which I would give at the Armadale Center, and she said to me that they pulled her through the difficult times. She would survive those times because of those stories, you know, the two bad bricks, open the door of your heart, and all those other stories which you know, I wrote in a book eventually. But she said, it's a crime, it's very bad, it's bad karma for you, Ajahn Brahm, you don't share those more widely. So why don't you write them down in a book? And this woman in Armadale asked me this and said, oh, you know, people think I work hard, but underneath all that, there's a lot of laziness there. If, somebody, if I can get somebody else to do it, I will. That's how I perceive it. It's probably not how you perceive it, but we all have our own little perceptions of our weaknesses and strengths. I much prefer just to sit in my cave, medita cave meditating all day. That's what I call laziness. This is not real laziness. It's actually really being so lazy you don't even think. You're so still. That's brilliant. That's so joyful. So I know that people think they're lazy. You're not. You go and just mess around. You waste time. And you think and you plan and you read and you go on the internet and you just, you know, check out this website, that website. That's not laziness. This is laziness. And this out, just doing nothing, really in the moment. So anyway, so I said, no, it's just too difficult for me. And I always admire, I'm not sure if she did this on purpose, but it was brilliant psychology. She totally uh, tricked me. She said, oh, I'll do it, okay. And I'm not sure if she did it in purpose, but she did such a terrible job of writing out the first few stories. I read them, I said, this is terrible, this is not my story, this is not how it should be told, this is how it should be told. So I wrote it out myself. She tricked me. So I had to write them out myself. But, Again, for that book, it was weird. And I love weirdness and strangeness because I was meditating a lot when I had a bit of free time to write out these stories. And I would just put aside one hour every afternoon just to write the stories down. And the first 54 stories of that book, the first half, it took just two weeks. 14 hours, I think it's only 14 hours, because the other day was we had the moon day where we had to do stuff. So 14 hours, the first stories. And I wrote them out longhand. And we still got the manuscript. I think uh, Cecilia's got that manuscript at the moment. And I looked at it because we, we gave it, it actually belongs to Hugh, Hugh Sykes, who actually you know, auctioned it and uh, he bought it as a donation thing for the nuns monastery, Damasara. But I looked at it again and it's almost perfect. There's hardly any errors in it. 
Because when you have deep meditation, you're not really thinking, you just write and it flows. You don't have to look back and correct yourself or just say, no, that's not the right word and, and cross it out and write something else. It just flows. So I took a break after two weeks and then I found time to do another bit here, another bit there, but it wasn't much of a burden at all. It just wrote out the story. And, of course, once it was written out, you have to find a publisher. And I've never done that before, finding a publisher. So, but anyway, that it was good old Ron's story who typed it up for us. And he's deceased now, but many of you may remember him. Uh, he was a very active member of our Buddhist society, caretaker, treasurer, many roles he volunteered for. And he put it into one of these little discs, CDs. And he just finished it, just before, this is the reason I'm telling the story now, just before I went to Melbourne to give some teachings. And the first stop from arriving at the Melbourne airport was a talk in Melbourne University. And I wasn't that well known in those days. So I went to give the talk at Melbourne University and afterwards somebody came up to me and said, oh, that's a lovely talk. I, I work in the publishing industry. If you ever have anything you want published, please show it to me. And I reached inside my bag. <laughs> just like this. It was just well, maybe the same bag. I just got it. Here you are. <laughs> and that's exactly what it was. And I never forget the lady's name. She worked for Lothian. It was a small publishing house in Melbourne. But her name was Magnolia Flora. I saw a name you can never forget. You know, it's, and that was her real name. She didn't change it. It was you know, Mrs. Flora and Magnolia. And so that she was quite surprised. But then, you know, I lost contact with her. And that was about 20 years ago, 15 years ago. And when I was giving a talk in Melbourne, I think in uh, uh, Box Hill Town Hall, or was it East Morven Town Hall? Anyway, one of those, East Morven Town Hall, this woman came up to me, smiled, do you remember me? And it was her, Magnolia Flora, uh, no, 20 years uh, older, so I really couldn't recognize her. And I knew she had gone through some cancer. And, you know, she used some of those stories to get into remission. And it came back again. But she used some of the loving kindness to banish it. So that was a nice little... These little things which happen in life, sometimes it's weird, it's strange. But there, you know, it was so easy to get that book published. It was so easy, you know, for, to write it out. And it seems like a circle was completed just when, just a week or two ago, she turned up and said how it helped her and also just how the stories were really, really wonderful. They really did something. But actually in that book, one of the stories which I, I wrote was again how joy changes pain. Because that was a story early days in Thailand. It's now 45 years now I've been a monk. And 45 years ago, when I ordained in Thailand, and I went to the northeast of Thailand, now that was really sort of um, very basic. And in those basic areas, we would travel from place to place. There was roads, dirt roads, full of potholes because of the, the rain. When it's sort of dirt roads, when it rained, they were not maintained. Only villagers would maintain them. And so they had little holes everywhere. And these little trucks, like utes we have here, they would have um, two benches in the back, just on either side, lengthwise. And they would have a, a railing a strung over... Uh, what do you call it? It's like a frame, a metal frame, over the back of the ute. A tarp, tarpaulin, was stretched over that to actually to protect the people sitting in the back, you know, from rain, keep them dry. And that was the main form of transport for monks going from place to place. 
except for the senior monks who would sit in the cab in the front. So, so often I'd be going in the back of those little, um, uh, they called them what song tell, uh, the, the two, two lines of um, two benches. I'd be going in there and you go over the holes in the road. It didn't really matter if you were in the cab, it was all just nice cushions everywhere. Even the ceiling just was cushioned. But in the back, every time you went over a pothole, the truck went down, my head went up, and you cracked it, you know, on the metal railing. Believe it or not, at that time, you know, I, I was considered to be tall, according to the, the average Northeasterner. And so I cracked my head first, and more often, and moreover, that if you were a lay person, you had a cushion called your hair to at least you know, lighten the blow, so I'd expect, but with a bald head, bang! It really, really hurt. And I would, when I hit crack my head, I would always, ow! Drive slowly! I would complain, even swear sometimes. I was only a young monk. And when the time monks hit their head, they would laugh. And that was one of the first times I thought, this is a totally different culture. Why is it there's a Westerner, I was getting very angry and upset and negative, but these time monks, they'd hit their head just as hard. What would they do? <coughs> they would laugh. That is the reason why I keep coughing. <coughs> <coughs> I laugh at my own jokes. You should not do that. But anyway, so that when um, uh, I saw those Thai monks uh, laughing, when they were really hurting themselves, and I thought, I've never seen this before. Why? And my first thought believe it or not, was, well, these time monks have been doing this much longer than I had just ordained. Maybe they've hit their head so many times, <laughs> yeah, they were brain damaged. <laughs> but I thought, no, no, I've lived with those monks, taught with them, they're not brain damaged, they're very intelligent and very kind, and that's not what a brain damaged person is. So I couldn't understand it. So, being brought up as a scientist, experiment. Try it out, find it out, come and see, see what happens. So I decided, I made this really strong resolution. The next time I crack my head, I'm going to condition myself, promise to myself, I'm not going to complain, I'm not going to swear, I'm not going to get angry, I'm going to laugh. So I was ready for it. As soon as I cracked my head, ha 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 ha! And I discovered an amazing secret. When you laugh, when you crack your head, it hurts much less. Should have known that. Do you believe me? If you don't, when you get home, ask the partner <laughs> to crack you on the head twice. <coughs> the first. <coughs> The first time, swear or get angry. The second time, laugh. And test it out. Come on, don't just believe. No, don't do that because sometimes I might, we, the Buddhist Society of West Australia might get sued. But anyway, if, I think you can understand because you've all sometimes had accidents or hurt. And if you laugh, you bring joy into whatever happens, you actually find that it is less painful and you find it is more um, healing you find that uh, so much of pain, sickness is supported by negativity and if you have some joy and learn how to create joy 
learn how to, to have some happiness whenever any bad thing's happening to you, you find it doesn't last that long and you're also, you heal pretty quickly and it's not so difficult, not so painful. Which is one of the reasons why if you do bring joy into your sickness, you find it doesn't have the same negative effect to you. I was once, uh, I was doing some, yeah, I'm a Buddhist Theravada monk, but you also uh, hang out with, with people from other religions, other faiths, or other parts of Buddhism. And that was the story when uh, one of the Tibetan nuns, an uh, Australian girl, and she had a terrible cancer, and she was in the hospice, the old hospice which was in Shenton Park. I don't know why they closed that down. But anyway, she was in the Shenton Park Hospice at a time when, you know, that I had had not so many things to do. And I would visit her, make sure she was okay. And then she called me one day in the morning. And, you know, I was busy, I think, building, working on something. But I remember the message came. She wanted to speak to me. It was urgent. And the reason was because she said, I'm going to die within 24 hours. And I, I've known this for long enough that sometimes, you know, when you're close to your time, sometimes you know, and better than the doctors do. The doctors will say, no, no, you know, it could happen any time, but, you know, probably a few days, a week or something. But she knew. And my goodness, she was right. You know, it did happen. So... I believed her, I trusted her, that she knew that she was you know, on the way out pretty quickly. So what I did was just stop whatever I was doing, get a driver, and do an hour and a half, I think, at that time, you know, from Bodhinyana Monastery in Serpentine over to Shenton Park, to the hospice. And I dropped whatever I was doing, it was an urgent. And so there, at that time, you had to check in with the head nurse. Because you know, they couldn't let anybody just go into the rooms of really sick, dying people. So I checked in with the nurse, and this nurse was like the, the uh, hospital equivalent of Margaret Thatcher. <laughs> I always remember Margaret Thatcher, some of her quotes said, some ministers you beat down, some you wear down, other ministers I grind down. She was a formidable lady, uh, one of her kind. But anyway, the, this nurse reminded her of, reminded me of her in many, many different ways. So she looked at me and she said, no, you cannot visit now this, this lady. And I said, but she just called me. I don't care about that. We have to respect our patient's wishes. But I've traveled all the way from an hour and a half. Come with me. She was really angry and really firm. She wanted to teach me a lesson. <coughs> and so we went to the patient's door. And true enough, there on the patient's door was a, was a, a notice which the patient herself, she had written. <coughs> Absolutely no visitors. And signed by the patient. And this nurse, this nurse, she looked at me, you know, with triumph in her eyes. See? She said, and of course some of you know the, what happened next. You know, I didn't need glasses in those days. I looked and there was a little small print at the bottom. And those were three words at the bottom. Except Ajahn Brahm. <laughs> <laughs> and I could not resist. Okay, it's not the most compassionate thing I could have done. But I looked at that nurse and said, ah, see? <laughs> and she went off in a huff. 
But I opened the door and the first thing I asked this dying Australian Tibetan nun, I said, no, why did you write that? And you know, she taught me a wonderful thing. She said, because so many people come into my room and they start weeping and crying and oh, what a terrible thing, I hope you get better, I hope you don't die. She said, I have my emotional trauma, my own pain to deal with and now they're loading all their emotional distress upon me. I've got to you know, help them instead of just dealing with my own you know, imminent death. And that's such a wonderful teaching. You know, when we go and see people who are sick and dying, oh, it's terrible to see you like that. And why are you like that? Because my cough was much worse when I was overseas, I got so much medicine. And I reflect now, all that medicine I was given was not for me. I was happy and enjoying my cough. It was to, so they wouldn't see me cough. They wouldn't be afraid it was going to get worse. It was actually for their happiness and benefit, not for mine. Just like we want to put someone out of their misery. It's not out of their misery. The cough was to, to make me better so I would be out of their misery. Didn't like me coughing all the time. How much times when we feel we're being helpful to other people, we're just trying to get rid of our negativity, of not seeing someone we, lo someone we love or care for being sick or fading away, or dying. And a lot of it was their problem. They were afraid of my sickness. They were upset with it. Me, I was quite happy having a cough every now and again. So, sometimes that she taught me, she said, every people who come and sees me, I'm the sick one, and they just want to heal me. They don't want to see me dying. They don't want to see me sick, but that's their problem. She said, you are Jambaram, she said to me, a very wonderful little um, piece of praise, you're the only one who comes in here and is not upset that I'm dying. And you just come in here and tell me jokes and funny stories. So we spent an hour together telling jokes and funny stories. And it said, just as if you were visiting like a friend in a coffee shop, just spending a wonderful hour together. So, she said I was talking to her, not her sickness. And she was a nun herself, she knew the process, she knew how to deal with it, she knew about the bodily feelings, she just wanted to spend an hour with a good friend before she passed away. And after that, you know, the call came the next morning from the nurse that uh, she passed away. And stunning to see just how accurate she was. She know how long she has left. So a lot of time, just sometimes with sickness, when they say, enjoy your sickness, make peace with it, be kind to it, accept it. So isn't that just letting it be? You should maybe be able to survive, maybe get better, maybe it won't get worse. Have you ever known when people fight these things? The very cause which create those sicknesses stress, get out of here you don't belong, it makes it worse. But when you're kind to it, make peace with it, it gets better. One of the, those great monks, always uh, repeats uh, uh, part of this story, was um, Ajahn Tate of Himak Peng in, Thai, in north of Thailand. He had some wonderful stories. One of the wonderful stories he had, it was on the banks of the Mekong River. And he was you know, a great Thai monk, and just opposite side was Laos, you know, just overrun by the communists there. And he said, one evening, they were doing their evening chanting before they started a meditation, and gunfire started to come into their, their meditation hall. You know, real bullets. And I remember just going there and seeing the potholes, you know, in the, the, uh, the cheap plaster 
where the bullets had hit. And I remember one of the monks I knew was there at the time, and Ajahn Tate just said, everybody on the ground. And they were wondering, why, why are those communists on the other side of the river in Laos territory, why are they shooting at us with peaceful people? And then one of the bullets hit the generator. And once they hit the generator and electricity went out, then the shooting stopped. And the people on the other side of the river, the communists, and said, and don't start that noisy generator ever again. <laughs> they weren't anti-Buddhist. They're just that generator they were using was just keeping them all awake. That's all it was. <laughs> but anyway, oh, okay, another couple of Laotian stories. Because I really admire the Laotian people because they were just the most laid back I've ever known. And on this, uh, this uh, one occasion, because again, one of my friends was in the second town of Luang Prabang during the Vietnam War and during the time when the communists in Laos were fighting the royalists, the government. And he went to one of these little restaurants which would never ever pass any health and safety regulations in Australia. They'd be shut down straight away. Dirty, unsafe, but such delicious food. And so he was in there having his food when you know, he saw the government troops were on, on one table having their lunch with their, their M16s. That's what they used to use, these, these really assault rifles. Just leaning against the bamboo thatch wall. And then he saw the communist troops come in with their guns. This was war. The communist troops and the royalist troops, they were fighting one another. And you know what happened? Just the communist troops, they went to another table, put their guns against the wall, and ordered lunch. And he actually dived under a table. But he realized how stupid he was, because in Laos, war always stops for lunch. <laughs> in those days, anyway, so they had these two enemies, you know, part of the armies were sitting at separate tables, you know, having their, um, their county on some dumb, you know, the sticky rice and uh, the papaya salad, which is a staple, on separate tables. And afterwards, you know, he said they, well, they left at different times. And they probably took different routes you know, by sort of agreement. Maybe the, the, the government troops turned right and the, the, the socialist troops turned left. <laughs> okay, come on, have a little laugh. I'm trying my best. <laughs> so they went in different directions, you know, on purpose, because... Uh, and that's a true story. One of the other stories he told me, I don't know if I shared this one, but I shared it when I was over in somewhere or other overseas recently, that, you know, this guy, he was English, trained in a public school, and so he went over to, um, to uh, Laos to live. Uh, and he was there during the whole um, uh, Vietnam War. And he was just very peaceful, very happy guy. <coughs> but after the communists took over, uh, one of the majors of the Patet Lao was basically took over as the head man of that little uh, district in Luang Prabang now the second city of Laos, that, you know, he came home early, he caught a thief in his house, stealing. And so he didn't really know what to do. Now in that British public school, he's a, you know, quite a big, strong guy, so he actually put him over his knee and spacked him. You know, not a very good thing to do, because that boy ran to the major and the communist troops came and arrested him. And the major said, this is not England, it's not a public school, you can't do this. 
and you know that the fellow was a thief, but you can't take law into your own hands. I have got to punish you, said the communist major. And this fellow just, you can imagine, just his fear. Because the communist major could just put him up against the wall and shoot him. Or just disappear him in many different ways. So he was terrified. But the communist major smiled at him and said, you're a rich guy, you've got some fun somewhere. So, your punishment is to throw a party for three days at your expense, paying for all the alcohol, all the food. He said, is that it? He said, yes, said the Major. He said, okay, I'll accept that punishment. And so, the Laotian people, I don't know that what's happened now, but those days, they hardly took anything so seriously. And so his punishment for breaking the law was to throw a party, which he also enjoyed as well, for three days, paying for everything. So anyway, that's Laos for you in those days, in the good old days. But anyway, I'm just going off from, because part of it which was really interesting was that monk, you know, on the other side of the, of the uh, Mekong River, who was shot at, you know, but they were just trying to um, hit the generator and they just kept hitting the hall, but you know, no one was injured or killed. So, he was one of the monks, very well known, and so he had this terrible cancer. And the king of Thailand was the one who was paying all his medical bills. And it got so bad, the doctors, and it's obviously really good doctors, the best they could possibly have at the time, said there's nothing more we can do. <coughs> so, they sent it, he said, well, instead of dying in Bangkok, I want to go back to my monastery on the Mekong River. I'll die there. And he kept his promise, he went back to the, uh, his monastery, what Hing Muk Peng, on the, on the Mekong River, and he did die there, about 25 years later. <laughs> and I know that story because you know, he was sick when I first came to Thailand, and I visited him a couple of times. That was his home. A lot of times that's one of the reasons why, when you go over uh, to a hospital, these days, it's a brilliant, wonderful idea that we can have much of that medical equipment miniaturized and taken to your bedroom in your house and have these wonderful silver chain nurses just come and look after you. But you're in your own home instead of some hospital with friends in your environment which you know and love. That is great for your health. Where would you like to be sick? In a hospital or at home? With the people you like and love and care for you? So it's, it's a wonderful to understand that the joy which that gives you. But I can't also go, leave alone the story of good old Ted. Uh, he was in a hospice, in the Murdoch hospice. In the Murdoch hospice where it was, was first opened. And I remember going to the opening ceremony you know, one of the major sponsors of that hospice in Murdoch was the, uh, the founder of the Dome coffee chain. It was not just a coffee chain, but it was you know, food as well. And he was this tall guy, apparently he was an uh, Olympian athlete before or something. I forget his name now, but he was tall and he was bald-headed, just like me. And just as a joke, I don't think I offended him, I said, is that why you gave it the, the name Dome? Because of your big bald head, which is like a dome. <laughs> but I don't know why he called it Dome, but anyway, that may be the underlying reason. But anyway, visiting Ted in that hospice, you know, just a little after the opening ceremony, Ted was a Yorkshire, uh, Lancashire man. And he smoked most of his life, as many people did, because they didn't realize it was going to kill you. 
And so when he developed his cancer, I went to go and visit him. And uh, when I visited him, that he was really sick, you know, just you know, a few days to go. And he told me, I think the second or third day, he said, oh, this is a great place to be. I said, why? He was really enjoying it in the hospice. I know the reason why. Because the very first evening, the nurse came and said, what are you having for dinner tonight, Ted? He said, oh, I've got diabetes, so I can't have anything sugary or sweet. I've got high cholesterol, so I can't have anything oily. I can't have anything salty because I've got hardened arteries. And the nurse said, stop! You're not going to die of a heart attack. You're not going to die of diabetes. You're not going to die of, of high cholesterol or hardened arteries. You're going to die of cancer. So you can eat whatever you want. <laughs> and Ted's eyes went wide, he told me. Really? And so he's ordered all of this greasy, like chips and, and fried fish, and all of this really sweet syrupy puddings and ice creams with lots and lots and lots of salt and a really good, healthy English food. <laughs> In some people's opinion. But anyway, he really you know, enjoyed his meals. Everything his wife and doctor and kids would not allow him to eat, he ordered. And this is it's only a true story. Three or four days later, he was in remission and he walked out of the hospital. He walked out of the hospice and he had another six months of life. Now, this is not recommended to everybody <laughs> because otherwise the Buddhist Society of West Australia would get sued again. <laughs> I followed your advice, Ajahn Baba, now I'm dead. But six months he had extra, and I remember going to see him one last time in the hospice when he went back and he said he died properly next time. <laughs> but I always remember Ted because I was there just as he was dying. And because you know, I was there in the morning, he said he's going to go any time, I was there with him chanting, looking after his family. And it got to about 11 o'clock, 11.30. No, monks, nuns, we had to finish our meal before midday. So I said, well, we've got to go out and get you something, Ajahn Brahm. So they, <coughs> the only thing they could get, I think it was a chicken treat somewhere close. So it was a chicken and chips, really fast food. And then there is a tradition. Many of you have seen me uh, follow this British tradition. If you have some chips, you always actually offer it to somebody else. Have a chip. Have a chip, Anusha. Have a chip, Dennis. Have a chip, John. And... He was in a coma, he was about to die, and this was his last words before he passed away. His daughter offered him a chip. You'd like a chip, Dad? Oh, yes, please. <laughs> and that was his very last words before he died. <laughs> that was really true, I was there. <laughs> so I don't say no. People think your last thought will determine your rebirth. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe he's been born in a fish and chip shop somewhere. <coughs> I can see the joy and the happiness. You know, when we do get sick, we all have to die one day and we all have to get sick sometimes. So it's something which is part of life. If you put joy into it, happiness into it, it's possible. It can be done. And it changes the whole ball game. And so you decide you're going to enjoy your sickness, if you can, each in your own way. You hit your head, yeah, it hurts, but you can laugh. You have an injection, yeah, it may sort of sting, but you can laugh. You can find some happiness and joy in there. And when you invite people into your room, Please don't invite misery people who keep saying, oh, it's terrible, you're sick. 
please, you know, get better soon. That's why I tell some people, I am an owner of my own karma. I am not going to follow your orders. When people say, get well soon, no. I will make that decision. You are not my nanny or auntie or mother. If I want to be sick, that is my privilege. And I will de de defend just my independence. So how many times do people try and put the, sort of the, the hard word on you? Get better soon. That's what we mean. Oh, we wish you get better. And so they put emotional pressure on me. I say, I always try and keep promises. So people say, we get better, and I say, yes. I'm in a double bind. Because if I get even more sick, I break my promises. Which is, you know, it's, it's the same as lying in Buddhism. Which is one of the reasons why when people say, may you get better soon? I say, no, I will not follow your orders. In other words, you have fun with the whole sickness process and the dying process. You know what happens then? Just like the Ajahn Tate. He came back to his own mo home monastery. It took him 20 years, 25 years before he passed away. So I, I did a couple of coughs here just for old time's sake. But come back home to Perth, I feel so much better. So next time I get sick, just send me to my cave in Serpentine. And then I will last a long, long, long time. Yay! And that is a talk about putting joy into sickness. Sadhu. Okay, come on, yeah. Okay, you can clap as well. Yay! Okay. Uh-oh. Got some questions now. And I hope all those people who were at my retreat in Thailand, or over in Melbourne, or over in um, Singapore, actually see just how improved I am. Here we go. Oh, there's no one from Hong Kong, or Singapore, or Thailand here. <laughs> to bring joy to sickness, does one have to let go in this letting go of craving to heal, staying on the middle path according to Buddhist teachings? To sometimes to let go of, of a lot of our um, cultural, emotional additions to sickness. In other words, uh, the deeper teaching on this, which I thank for, uh, didn't actually say, so thank you for this question was the teaching of the Buddha to um, Nalaka Mata, Nalaka Pita. Even though the body is old and sick, the mind does not need to be sick. You can separate those two out, your mind and your body. And please, if someone can find this again for me, I read an article that there's two neural pathways of pain. One is physical, and there's one which is mental. They go to different parts of the brain, apparently. And so there's more to this. You know, there's some deeper teachings here. To have joy when a person is sick is understanding the primacy, the dominance of the mind. The physical feelings you can't do too much about. You will stub your toe. You will get a headache, you will get a sickness from time to time, bodily sickness. That's unavoidable. But your mental response, that you have power over. You have choice to put joy into sickness or to put negativity. Why me? So it is a choice. Understanding the Dharma, letting go and experience what we mean by those two different pathways. What the Buddha called the two darts or the two thorns. And learning how they are different. And learning how, even though you may be in great physical pain, the mind can still have joy. 
How can I develop joy if the sickness makes me feel sad? And how can I make my loved ones be joyful if they are sad on my account? There's obviously, the loved ones are mostly the, please excuse me here, the problem. Because they just don't understand the nature of the mind and the body. So it would be great if those loved ones you know, had more understanding about this Buddha's teachings, especially those on meditations. Feeling sad because their loved one is sick, does that help the loved one, the person who's actually sick? You know, that's what that, that Tibetan nun taught me. All those so-called loved ones, they weren't caring about the person who was dying. They were just reacting to their emotional distress and trying to heal their own emotional distress about seeing someone who's sick and dying. I try and, please don't do that, please don't die, don't get sick. Not because they were caring for the person, because they did not comprehend, they weren't at peace with their own attachments, with their own fears sometimes. Seeing their loved ones sick, in pain, realizing that could happen to them any time. Please get better, for our sake. Not for your sake. So it was actually often a selfish response. The same as putting someone out of their misery. It's not putting someone out of their misery, it's putting them out of your misery. So sometimes uh, we don't question our emotional responses. If we question them like I question swearing when I hit my head, by experimenting and laughing, you actually opened up new avenues of emotional response to the pain and disappointment and suffering of life. How can a very sick person be happy when he knows he has to leave his loved ones soon, especially small kids? You always have to leave your loved ones. All that is mine, beloved and pleasing, will one day become separated from me. It's something we used to chant day after day after day when I was a young monk in Thailand. They're not your kids. They came into your body. They came and you nurtured them, you watched them grow, you fed them at your breast. And they grew and grew. But you cannot always be there as their mother. There comes a time when they have to leave or you have to leave. That time is out of your control. It's not your choice. Your loved ones or your attachments. What's the difference there? I'm not being cold because we really know love. The highest, most powerful act of love is to let someone go. Small kids, this is from Sri Lanka. You have big families over there, aunts and, and uncles. I don't know why this, and every time you know, I go to school, I go, oh, I'm a relative of so-and-so, 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 or a cousin or something. You know, your relational ties in Sri Lanka are just so amazing. You're related to almost anybody, everybody. That's what it seems to me, that's what I hear. And you know, I'm a distant cousin of somebody who comes to your temple. So anyway, your small kids, they have many aunts, many uncles, many other people. And again, when my own father died, I was 16, maybe not a small kid, but you know, he still needed a dad at that time. But I learned so much from that. Yeah, it was just difficult, but you learn, you grow, and even small kids you know, who lose their mother or father, as long as there's someone to look after them, which they are in Sri Lanka usually, it's wonderful it's how much they can grow and learn and develop. Never underestimate the resourcefulness of young children. So anyway, that's how I can do. You, you know, be happy. If you know you're going to leave your loved ones soon, then you've got a choice. It's not you know that you, you can't stay around. 
Being sad in those last days, what are you teaching your children? Being joyful in those last days when you're sick, knowing you're going to die soon, you're teaching your kids a powerful lesson. Even though the body is sick, the mind does not need to be sick. A powerful lesson you're teaching them. So please take that chance and that opportunity. Excellent. So, any other questions? Come on, Eddie. I've missed you over the last two months. Yeah, come on. Yeah, sorry? It's a personal experience, Ajahn Brahm. <laughs> I think I'll share it. Okay? okay. This is a rude, true thing. Can I stand here and show the. Okay, just here. Yeah, yeah. But, but, but just don't make it a sermon, just I make it a question. No, 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 no. So, five yeah. minutes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, a few years ago, no, okay? Uh, no, this is regarding the power of positive thinking, how it helps to heal you, you know. Yeah. That's my, my experience, yeah. A few years ago, unknown to me, you know, there's a, a little problem, okay, yeah. And then the, um, yeah, then there was one time uh, for a problem, I, I felt like not well, you know, like feeling here, down feeling. So it was only for a few days, okay. So I called my friends, you know, I said, oh, there's well, something like, a, you know, like a, something wrong with me, I don't feel well, you know. And they said, oh, no, Eddie, you've been looking after your mom, all these things, you need holiday, and all, you know. No. So they, then I was thinking, mm, you know, so there's one morning, while having my shower, Saturday morning, my shower, and I was saying, hell, what the hell? shit, you know, sorry. I'm a Buddhist, this thing, but it's what's wrong, you know. Then like, I was trying my, you, 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 you had to put effort, you know, cause and effect, it's causing it. So, so, oh, unknown to me that this thing was happening, okay, yeah, yeah. And then what I did was, I, I, oh, my mind over matter, so I put positive thinking, Okay? When I put the post, the, the, the feeling was made, the main fit, made me not well, was a sinking feeling, okay? When I put the positive thinking, the, the, the energy here went up, you know. When it was up, I was okay. Yeah. Yeah. And then after that, it sank again, and, oh my, no, no. And then I put all this positive thinking, it went up again, I was well, and I was well. And then I was, oh, just well. I just cured instantly. Let me share with you. I've mentioned this to a few people, I can't meet here, it's, it's this, yeah. this one, the, the energy is from here, it's from the thinki, thinking, it was a sinking feeling, okay? So when you put the positive thinking, it went up to level again and you're well. But you have to put an effort in you know, in a lot. So in fact, the, the problem was I was looking after my mom during the final days, you know, it was a bit difficult, okay, uh, 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 yeah, yeah. And then, then I, you know, then that, that's how this came. But, you know, so I was trying to make effort in what's wrong, oh, you know, so I put this positive thinking and then that went up this thing, okay, and it, it came up. Very good. Sorry, yeah. I just don't share with you, you know, my, my yeah. experience. I know always, um, Eddie always comes to monastery and says, praise the Lord, Buddha. Praise the Lord, Buddha. Praise the Lord. Very good. Okay, very good. Um, I mentioned that at the very end because when I was in Singapore, I think yesterday, somebody came along and said, you know, you Buddhists, you know, do you cure people and have miracles and stuff like that in the Pentecostal churches? I said, yeah, of course. We don't just, you know, stand up and start, start shouting hallelujah. We keep it just low key. And he said, well, why don't you actually tell people that? Because you get more sort of uh, people coming to your temples. So we got enough people come to the temple already. We've got things called, you know, the, the maximum number of people we can have in here. <laughs> but it does, we do do amazing things and I've known many of those stories. So, yeah, we do that too. Uh oh Yeah. Yes. Yeah, hallelujah. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, come on, we can now pay respects to Buddha Dhamma Sangha. No. Thank you, Eddie. We love you. No, it just the Buddhist Western Australia wouldn't be the same without you.
cốt rồi Cô bỏ cốt đầu rồi Thank <laughs> you. 